Hello Penguinauts, I'm the Beardy Penguin and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Beyond Kerbal. In the previous episode we landed on Valiant, the outermost moon of Reaper, and sent this packed exploration vehicle into its oceans, where we found evidence of an ancient life form which has unfortunately since gone extinct thanks to the rapidly changing environment. However, in this episode we are sending our packs on a surface expedition. You can see there Katrina Kerbal and going a little bit crazy with her driving, I'm sure making Tibbin and Herman absolutely grip the edges of their seats. You see there we get some pretty sick air uh, testing the suspension, yeah, rightfully so, as this moon has got relatively low gravity, so we can have a little bit of fun. I actually had one hand on the wheel controls, because I bind those to the arrow keys, and then the other hand on the actual attitude controls, so WASD, to make sure that we didn't flip over. Uh, it was actually quite good fun, just pelting along uh, and seeing how far I, how fast I could actually go over the surface but uh, without too much traveling we managed to get ourselves up into a different biome after a very stylish barrel roll there from Katrina and we screeched to a halt getting a beautiful view from the top of this mountain and you see there Reaper just emerging over the horizon we're just going to send Herman Kerman out to get him to plant a nice little flag and we'll put the plaque an unmatched view of the entire reaper system so we're just gonna time warp a little bit and ah oh, look at that what an impressive view this really has been a beautiful series of episodes exploring this uh, this system but unfortunately all good things must come to an end you see morningstar just orbiting over there so we head ourselves back to the mustang cargo ssto and we're going to head back up into orbit now as i'm sure you remember from the previous episode we're actually planning to now take a diversion to eltos since we're already all the way out in the outer solar system we might as well so we're going to try and have an efficient ascent well as efficient an ascent as we can because we only have a limited amount of oxidizer unfortunately though the atmosphere is so thin that we couldn't actually take off uh, using the air breathing mode on these Sabre engines. Um, there isn't actually enough intake air into the engines until you've got a decent amount of speed going to keep them ignited and stop them flaming out. So we had to just have a little burst from the closed cycle mode, burn a little bit of our oxidizer just to get ourselves into the air. So a bit of a hop, skip and a jump into the sky, but we managed to get ourselves rather ungracefully airborne, carrying the packed rover up because I did realize that uh, all of our scientific instruments we're on that rover, so uh, it'd be a little bit pointless going to Altos without it, but once again, getting some truly, truly gorgeous views. Now, this ascent actually took quite some time, uh, as I said, mainly due to the very, very thin atmosphere. So the intake airflow to these engines is really very poor. So until we get to much higher speeds, they aren't producing a great amount of thrust. So what you have to do is gain a bit of altitude and then descend back through the uh, atmosphere to pick up some speed, break through the sound barrier. And then once we've actually got through the sound barrier, uh, our engines then it's sort of a bit of a positive feedback loop the faster we go the more thrust they produce which then makes us go faster and faster and faster but it does take a little bit of time to actually get to that point so in the meantime i'm gonna have a little chat about the series so a lot of people have been saying ah beardy you know you're in lockdown now why haven't we been getting beyond kerbal like every other day well yeah i am in lockdown but it's not like i'm just sitting on my computer twiddling my thumbs uh, with nothing better to do all day i have actually been keeping myself very very busy uh, as well as having quite a lot of uni work still left to do uh, in the next two weeks or so before online classes actually start when the new uh, the new term begins um, also, my family has started a number of large renovation projects uh, in and around my house since, well, we now we have a lot of time to do them. So I'm pretty much out in the garden or working on something uh, from about nine until four. And then I like to try and get a little bit of uni work done. And I'm also teaching myself piano at the moment because, you know, you can never know enough instruments. I already sing, play violin and saxophone to grade 8 standards so you know, <laughs> I had another one to my toolkit I guess uh, which I am quite enjoying I can currently play Oh When the Saints and Kumbaya so you know getting there slowly but surely so yeah I've got a lot of other hobbies a lot of other passions a lot of things that have been uh, keeping me busy so um, it does take a long time to make Beyond Kerbal I am working on it every now and then but it's similar to also why people ask why I'm making 
you know, episodes of a new Fallout series. I am playing the original Fallout game. I'll have a, a link in the end screen at the end of the video. Mainly because, you know, like a 20 minute Fallout video takes 20 minutes to make. Whereas a 20 minute Beyond Kerbal video will take, mm, I don't know, maybe about six hours or so to record and then I also have to speed it all up and edit it and then do post commentary although I have got a lot better at doing the post commentary uh, in one take hopefully I can do this one in one take haven't had any mishaps so far I used to have to do the post commentary in about five or six different takes because I'd suddenly run out of things to talk about and it would just go silent so I'd have to stop the recording and then continue it from uh, the last point but no I've got quite good at just blathering on and on and on uh, about <laughs> random things to try and filter Time. You do find that when you start as a YouTuber, I know a lot of people, a lot of people on my Discord especially, who are trying to get started with YouTube, they just don't know what to talk about. And the, the truth is, there isn't any magic solution. You just got to try and just chat about what's happening in front of you or just ramble about life stuff like I tend to in these videos. Um, and eventually you just get better and better at it. Um, it does actually have a knock-on effect as well. I found that I'm significantly better at small talk and stuff in real life and filling awkward silences just because I have to do it so much for the internet. You know, if I can talk talk to myself on end uh, for countless uh, minutes and even hours at a time then uh, I'm pretty sure I can do it in the presence of other people as well. But you can see there once we manage to get ourselves up to a high enough velocity and getting ourselves out of the atmosphere we use the RCS systems to push ourselves into orbit trying to save as much oxidizer as possible and then we're actually using Morningstar to do the rendezvous itself because we still have loads of liquid fuel uh, to power those main engines there those nuclear engines that propel Morningstar through the cosmos but yeah oxidizer is the thing we are running rather low on thankfully though we managed to have an efficient enough ascent with the atmosphere being as thin as it is and the gravity also being as low as it is and and then also only putting just enough fuel into the Mustang to actually get it down to the surface and get it back up into orbit again that yes we have more than enough oxidizer left over to go land on Eltos. As I said in the previous episode I could have gone back to Valm and refueled the whole spacecraft again but I really couldn't be bothered. It was much easier just to try and do things as efficiently as I could here so that we could just go straight to Eltos without having to worry about it. And Eltos actually has lower surface gravity um, than uh, Valiant does so now we actually have more oxidizer available to us than um, <laughs> that I put into the Mustang uh, for the descent to Valiant. So yeah, we're going to be absolutely fine. So now we've returned the Mustang to Morningstar, what we're going to do is going to transfer all of the oxidizer that we stored in our Ragnar spacecraft, um, since we didn't have any other place to store all of our spare oxidizer. So we're going to transfer that out of the Ragnar, and now it's pretty much just dead weight. So uh, once we've transferred all of that across over to the Mustang to see there, uh, it's just dead weight. So we're going to try and get rid of it now. It has served us well. We landed on Tilos with it, uh, but yeah, it has no purpose anymore. I mean, the lower stage was the one that had all the landing lights and the important parts so there's no point carrying it around. It is going to make our center of mass a little offset but uh, the main engines of Morningstar have got such a high gimbal range that it actually isn't a problem whatsoever. So farewell Ragnar, we fill it with a little bit of monopropellant, something that we have plenty, plenty to spare and uh, we're going to send it down into the atmosphere of Valiant to try and keep the space debris down. We are leaving some spacecraft in orbit uh, in this series. So, for example, we left the Severolander in orbit of Valm in case we wanted to come back and use it. Uh, spacecraft are actually useful for the body they're orbiting, but no, Ragnar is never going to land on anything again. So, farewell, sweet chariot, and we're going to send it to have a fiery Viking funeral into the depths of Valiant's atmosphere. I say depths, it's a very thin atmosphere, so as you see we're barely even slowed down before it plunges into the surface. So what we're going to do is then actually transmit a tiny bit of science from the surface of Valiant and that actually completes our very last contract. So finally we no longer have any contract whatsoever because I mean we stopped needing to use contracts uh, near the end of the previous series as soon as we set up Artemis and we started doing mining operations uh, on Nemesis the moon of solitude we had more than enough money uh, especially with the bonuses you get from having colonies as well you actually just get rewards for having colonies on other celestial bodies. Uh, so that gives us more than enough science, reputation and funding to keep our space program going along with our mining operations of exotic minerals. So yeah, we just don't need contracts anymore and all of them are a little annoying to actually complete and a little bit sort of grindy. None of them have got particularly good rewards anymore. We've, we've done most of the tasks in this uh, solar system. So 
uh, yeah, we don't really need to be using contracts anymore. But it's nice to have them all finished, so uh, we don't have to worry about them anymore. So, now we've just got to wait, essentially, for the transfer window to Eltos, which will be in a year's time. So what we actually did was froze all the non-essential crew, and we're just going to leave our scientists on Morningstar, researching all the data, the <laughs> absolute volumes of data that they now have from all the various moons over the next year or so and now we swap ourselves back to our constellation mission which we haven't seen in a few episodes so they've actually been hanging out around the wasteland for just over a year at this point uh, and now it's time to send them home again so we've run out of hab time on the akira base down at the surface and our transfer window is about 100 days away so what we're doing is we're sending lemor kerman in our sovereign ssto down to the surface to pick up our four kermanauts who have been inhabiting the Akira base for the previous year or so. Uh, I'm sure they've got some, some pretty stocky legs at this point since they all grew up on Solitude which has 0.8 Gs of gravity uh, and this planet of course has a single G of gravity so uh, they're gonna you know every day has been leg day for the past year so they're gonna be nice and bulked up ready to fly into the arms of their dearest sweethearts when they get back home to Solitude. You see here uh, we do have a little bit of a, an issue on, on atmospheric entry. Um, as you see there, we sort of undershot a little bit. So just sort of fire up the Sabre engines in their air breathing mode and just have one little boost and then just shut them off again and coast over the Great Kerbal, uh, Kerbin Mountains and then head on towards the ruined Kerbal Space Center. So yeah, this mission's uh, really been quite a remarkable success. Um, it always makes me happy when massive missions like this pay off so well. I mean, the Constellation mission and the Morningstar mission have both gone pretty much flawlessly. Um, and yeah, it's great when you put so much planning and so much effort into these missions to have them work out pretty much perfectly. Uh, and you see here, though, uh, <laughs> it did take a couple of attempts to get this landing right because... Much like Valiant, the atmosphere on the wasteland is quite thin now, so we have to take our landing approach at very, very high speed. I don't know how we didn't lose one of those air brakes. You see that they bang against the ground multiple times, but just sort of end up closing slightly instead of being knocked completely off. And we managed to just about judder to a very shaky stop, uh, but I'm sure that probably knocked a few of Lemor's teeth out with how violent that impact was. So here we are, Akira. It's been sitting studying the KSC ruins and uh, actually searching for a particular black box buried underneath the ruins of the R&D center for the past year. A black box that one of our scientists actually managed to find. But before we head off back into orbit, Ermel Kerman just gonna get out and leave a flag, a memorial to the fallen. And something I, I really liked there was once he planted the flag, he actually slapped his hand against his chest, which I thought was was such a wonderful coincidence uh, and such a beautiful uh, little sort of sight. <laughs> Planting a flag, a testament to uh, his fallen home world and just sort of hand against his chest, shine, a sign of respect for all of his fallen brethren, which I think was really rather beautiful. But anyway, we're gonna get our Kerbals now into the crew compartment of the Sovereign SSTO and blast them back up into orbit. I don't see us coming back to our original homeworld again uh, so it's a little bit of a tearful goodbye but we've certainly spent more than enough time here we had one very short-lived mission here to come study the KSC ruins and now we've had this much longer term mission this self-sustaining mobile base and we've explored all the different biomes and spent an extremely long amount of time studying these ancient ruins but what was in that black box beardy well I'll tell you about that in just one second we're just going to get into the air first and we're going to have yet another long uh, SSTO flight up into orbit so uh, we can have quite an extensive chat. And we had the same problem we had with the Mustang here and that the atmosphere is just too thin to stop the engines flaming out uh, so we had to actually fire once again the closed cycle mode before we could do a little hop skip and a jump up into the sky. That Takeoff took about three attempts, I believe. Uh, so you see there, we did uh, get dangerously close to the lava oceans of the wasteland, but fortunately, uh, we managed to get ourselves a little shakily into the sky. Thankfully, we don't have to be too worried about um, conserving oxidizer. As long as we have enough to get ourselves into orbit, uh, we're not too worried about the fuel situation on this SSTO. Anyway, Ermal Kerman, during his studies of all of the 
KSC structures found a black box buried underneath the R&D center containing a number of theoretical technologies, one of which was the Daedalus Fusion Drive. Yes, that's right, the very drive that we've researched very, very recently with data sent back from this Akira base. Although the Daedalus Drive was never constructed by the old Kerbal Space Agency, they did manage to resolve a number of outstanding equations that have been puzzling our scientists. They managed to make a self-sustaining fusion reaction, something that has up until recently eluded us. And so with this final piece of the puzzle, we are now finally able to construct a vast Daedalus fusion engine. So we now have the propulsion system that we need in order to blast off to another star system. So that's been the sort of secret purpose of this long-term mission. It's been to try and find any clues that uh, our ancient ancestors might have had to this particular propulsion puzzle and thankfully we've actually managed to find it just a small list of equations buried in amongst a huge volume of other data that our Kerbals have been processing over the past year finally managed to give us the final piece of the puzzle that we needed so we can head back home with our heads held high with this technology pretty much ready now for us to build an interstellar starship but first, of course, we need to get all of our Kerbals back up to Constellation. Uh, Constellation, of course, doesn't have any cryo bays because the wasteland really isn't very far away from Solitude. Uh, so it's only quite a short trip. I believe our transfer window, yeah, is in about 100 days or so. Uh, so we're going to research some of the data that they've been processing on the ground. But really, most of the science from this mission uh, has come from the actual science lab on Akira itself, um, which was producing a huge amount of science because it was actually on the surface of another world. It's, I think it might genuinely be the first time I've built any kind of base um, on the surface of another well, another planet. I've certainly built plenty of bases on the surface of moons and the like, but uh, yeah, I've never actually built a proper base on the surface of another planet, even in stock playthroughs. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's just pretty cool um, that we managed to make a, a mobile one. Uh, but it's also why, you know, the whole prospect of building a self-sufficient colony in another star system is so terrifying. I need to essentially get every detail of our interstellar mission perfect because once we're out there we're alone this series is going to follow that one ship of getting everything ready for next ships uh, to arrive but it's going to be a 10 year journey and they're going to be very much on their own once they're out there so uh, i'm really quite excited though to sort of follow the adventures of just this one single ship pretty much all on its own um, and producing its own spacecraft and you know relying on resources that they find in the other star system uh, to actually explore it in its entirety as well as setting up the colony depending if you guys are interested you know I'm pretty sure once we set up the colony we want to continue exploring the new solar system um, because we've explored this one so yeah I think it's only fair to uh, to branch out and try and explore the new one as well but anyway the sovereign has now returned and now we've got our Kerbals and our scientific data on board it's just dead weight so we cut it loose and we prepare to to blast off back to solitude in the next episode. Thank you very much for watching everyone. I've been the Beta Penguin and I will see you all next time.